Hello, and welcome to Mission San Luis, a 17th century Spanish mission to the Appalachian Indians located in present-day Tallahassee, Florida. My name is Jerry Lee, and I'm an archaeologist with Florida's Bureau of Archaeological Research, stationed here at the mission. Today, I'd like to share with you some of what we've learned from excavations in the mission's cocina, or kitchen. San Luis was the Spaniards' provincial capital of Appalachian province, the region between the Osceola and Oclockney rivers and the homeland of the Appalachians. The mission site that we've been investigating is San Luis' second location. It was relocated here in about 1656 from an earlier site to the east. Under the threat of attack by the English and their Indian allies, it was the Spaniards themselves who destroyed the mission and abandoned the province in 1704. During that near half century, San Luis was the largest or almost the largest of all the Spanish Appalachian missions. It was different from most missions because not only did one or two Franciscan friars serve a large number of Appalachians, but San Luis was also home to a range of other Spaniards including soldiers, administrators, and civilians. The religious complex of San Luis was made up of three buildings, the church, the friary, and the kitchen, which was the smallest structure of the group. This three-structure plan has been seen at a few other southeastern missions, but seldom with the clarity of that at San Luis. The general location of the religious complex had been suggested by large amounts of daub and fired clay recorded here during the 1984 Augur survey of San Luis. When archaeological investigation in the religious complex began in late 1986, several different methods of survey were utilized, but one of the most effective was a coring survey. A one-inch sampler tube was used at two-meter intervals to look for the presence or absence of fired clay. Since the buildings of the religious complex were believed to have been built with wattle and daub technology, clay plastered over a wooden framework, and since those structures were burned in 1704, the presence of fired clay was thought to best predict the locations of the structures. It is interesting to note that the location of the mission church was not included in the coring survey because little fired clay was identified there in the earlier auger testing of the site. Nevertheless, the results of that coring survey located the structure that would be identified as San Luis Franciscan Friary and also suggested another building to the west as well as structural remains to the north. The mission kitchen was situated about 12 meters or 40 feet west of the friary. It was oriented northwest to southeast at the same angle as the friary, both generally following the orientation of the primary road that extended from San Luis to St. Augustine on the Atlantic coast. As you will see, the excavation of this structure was complex. But in broad terms, we uncovered a wattle and daub structure that served as the mission kitchen, evidence of a connection with the friary that was probably a covered walkway, and a number of wall trenches south of the kitchen that may have represented animal pens or small kitchen gardens. We also excavated a fairly large pit a little south of the kitchen. Based on the results of that earlier coring survey, we had a good idea of where to begin, and our first excavation unit came down on a layer of whitewashed daub and fired clay rubble. As we exposed more of this layer, its edges were oriented at a northwest to southeast angle. The boundaries of the rubble, we called it Area 611, were pretty sharp, indicating that the walls of this structure had collapsed inward. As we began to clear the daub rubble, we reached a well-defined clay floor that we termed Feature 110. 
The clay floor had been baked hard by the fire that consumed the building and preserved all that whitewashed daub and fired clay rubble. Unlike the friary, which had a lot of post-mission disturbance, this building was remarkably well preserved. There was one minor rubble-filled pothole at its south wall. We called it Area 672, but that was the only significant disturbance that we recorded. The clay floor followed the lines of the outer post molds pretty closely, except for the west end, where it extended a very short distance beyond the wall posts. There was some indication of post molds at the level of the clay floor, but most of the post features became clear only as the floor itself was removed. The rubble over the floor held a lot of hand-wrought hardware, and many examples were also found on the clay floor. One concentration of wrought hardware was encountered on the floor right next to several chunks of charcoal, one of which would turn out to be post mold 86 in the south wall. We called it area 649, and it turned out to hold 17 intact nails and two spikes. It didn't appear to be a random group of hardware. All but one nail was pointing either north or south. It looks more like a post-destruction cache of collected hardware. Another area on the clay floor would prove to be of great interest. On the northwestern quadrant of the floor was a concentration of fired clay rubble over a nearly black soil matrix. We called it Area 648, and this fired clay rubble had a different look. It was tabular and of a consistent thickness. It wasn't whitewashed. It had no rounded wattle impressions in the fired clay, but some flat-sided wood impressions were noted. After we removed the first level of Area 648, we could see charred food remains, corn, beans, and nutshell in that black soil, and we redefined it as feature 111. This feature represented the remains of a clay stove and helped to seal the identification of the building as the mission kitchen. The Waddle and Dog kitchen measured eight by 5.3 meters, or about 26 by 17 feet. There were places where the walls were unusually well-defined. You could trace the north and west walls by lines of burned clay and in places by the remnants of charred wattles. All of the post molds of the building were profiled or cross-sectioned, except for the northwest corner post, which was close to a tree. Although we had to remove the disturbance of Area 672, post mold 93 within post hole 71 was right there beneath it. Unlike the friary, none of the posts were clearly hewn. They all seemed round in shape. The four posts on the center line of the structure's long axis, post molds 82, 87, 88, and 91, were somewhat deeper than the other posts. They probably supported a ridge pole indicating a gabled roof. There was also evidence of some sort of a partition between post molds 87 and 88 but that partition apparently didn't extend to the west wall at post mold 91. The primary entrance of the kitchen was apparently near its northeastern corner, but that doorway was inferred by the series of paired features that extended from that corner toward the friary. These paired features appear to represent a covered walkway between the two buildings. We traced the paired features to the east where a big oak tree prevented us from looking at its connection with the friary. Several of the paired features were sectioned, and rather than good post molds in post holes, they were just shallow basins. It looks like little supports were set on the ground surface or in scooped out depressions and garbage collected around their bases. With a light thatch covering, they would have offered some protection when delivering food from the kitchen to the friary. There was a wall trench that represented some construction at the north wall of the kitchen. 
Feature 117 cut through the post hole for post mold 84 and abutted that support. It might have been evidence of the entrance to the kitchen, or perhaps a ramada or a lean-to against the kitchen's north wall. Several wall trenches were recorded south of the kitchen, all of them oriented like the buildings in the religious complex. Some historians have described little gardens associated with missions. Few nails and little burned clay was recovered around these wall trenches, and they look like impermanent fencing, maybe to keep animals in, but I think more likely to keep animals out of just those sorts of kitchen gardens. Well south of the kitchen, we excavated a fairly large pit, feature 124. It looks like feature 124 may have been one source of the clay used for the kitchen's walls and floor, although it couldn't have been the only source. That pit was used for trash disposal after it had fulfilled its main purpose. Now within the dog kitchen's footprint and beneath its clay floor was evidence of an earlier structure. This was a rectangular construction delineated by a wall trench. It was oriented just like the dog kitchen, but measured a little smaller, seven and a half by four and a half meters, or about 25 by 15 feet. This earlier building was apparently separated into two rooms, one slightly larger than the other. We called this earlier wall trench Feature 112, and it was clear that Feature 112 was intruded on by post hole 65, the post hole for the Daub Kitchen's central support post. It has been postulated that the smaller structure represented by Feature 112 was the first friary, used as the Franciscan's residence before the larger Daub friary was constructed. There is, however, other evidence that suggests the earlier structure also served as a kitchen. A few of the paired features that connected the kitchen to the friary extended underneath the clay floor of the later Daub kitchen and came right up to feature 112. There was a variety of food remains identified from feature 112 too. Of course, both interpretations are possible. It may have been the first friary, which could have been repurposed as a kitchen for a short period before the Daub kitchen was built. I've already mentioned the large pit we excavated south of the kitchen, feature 124. Among feature 124's imported majolica assemblage was a type known as Castillo polychrome, which was produced in Mexico about 1680. Since Castillo polychrome majolica was also recovered from one of the post holes within the friary, it seems that both the Daub Friary and the Daub Kitchen probably date to the last quarter of the 17th century. So what else did the excavations tell us about the kitchen? I mentioned that the Daub walls of the building collapsed inwards when it burned, and we recorded nearly two and a half tons of fired clay construction materials from its interior contexts and just over 500 pounds of fired clay from outside the kitchen. Besides the building itself, the only other significant concentrations of fired clay were associated with the walkway contexts. Now this isn't because the walkway was constructed of wattle and daub, it wasn't. Nearly all of the fired clay from the walkway contexts were from its extreme east and west ends, where a little daub and fired clay from the friary and kitchen had spilled over onto it. The frame of the kitchen was fastened together with wrought iron hardware. We recovered hundreds of wrought nails or spikes, and two-thirds of them came from inside the kitchen's walls. The walkway contexts also held some wrought nails, but most were found at either end nearest the two structures. Only a few nails came from the middle portion of the walkway. It seems that it was a pretty flimsy covering and might even have been lashed or tied together. There were differences between the ceramics we found inside the kitchen contrasted with those recovered from inside the friary. Pottery was more abundant and native-made potsherds 
far more numerous within the smaller kitchen than in the larger friary. Now, this is probably because the Appalachian cooks were using their own familiar vessels for cooking. Olive jars were larger imported vessels used for transport and storage. There were many fewer fragments of them within the kitchen than in the friary. Fragments of tin enameled majolicas produced in Mexico and imported into San Luis were pretty well represented within the kitchen. There were more broken sherds of Kelowna ware in the kitchen than in the friary. Kelowna wares were vessels produced by Appalachian potters in European forms. The typical European vessel forms that were produced at San Luis were tableware forms used in food service, like brimmed plates, bowls, and pitchers. When looking at the broader evidence supplied by the ceramics from the kitchen and friary, it seems at least plausible that some of the tableware used for food service, both Kelowna wares and imported Spanish tableware, was stored within the kitchen. Now, there are several other possible explanations for some of the differences in the pottery of the two buildings. For instance, if the friary was swept clean more often than the kitchen, that might explain the kitchen's higher overall pottery numbers. We recovered several stone artifacts that were used in food preparation. A fragment of a quartzite cobble with a ground surface was recovered from inside the kitchen, and a few other similar cobble fragments came from the units south of the kitchen. Basalt grinding tool fragments were recovered in a few places outside the kitchen. These were imported from Mexico, and one fragment from south of the kitchen is complete enough to identify as a mano, the handheld tool that would be used against a larger metate. Two other imported basalt fragments came from the walkway contexts. One was a smaller fragment of what might be a mono from the west end of the walkway. The other is larger and tentatively identified as a matate fragment from area 826, the paired walkway feature closest to the friary. One stone artifact recovered right next to the north wall of the kitchen is identified as a slate pencil fragment. Slate pencils and tablets used to record important but impermanent information are more commonly associated with shipping and are sometimes found on colonial period shipwrecks. San Luis had many connections to shipping through the port of San Marcos, just a short distance to the south. There was a tabular slate fragment from a walkway context and a small concentration of them in and around the friary, although not one of them was from a good mission context. The presence of the slate pencil fragment next to the kitchen might indicate the importance of literacy within the religious complex. At the very least, it suggests that some kind of impermanent information was being recorded. We identified nearly 200 glass beads from within the kitchen. That's a pretty high number of beads, but that number is biased by the fact that we screened the rubble over the floor, the clay floor itself, and all of the post and other structural features within the kitchen through fine 1 16th inch mesh to catch the very smallest artifacts. If we had used the quarter inch mesh that we generally use for screening samples, we would have recovered only five beads. Like virtually all contexts at San Luis, blue was by far the most common color of the glass beads. As in the friary, one silver Spanish coin was recovered from the kitchen's interior. It's a half real coin, and although very worn, it looks like it was minted in Mexico City. There was a wider variety of personal objects from the kitchen's exterior. There were almost 40 glass beads, but there were also glass pendant and jet rosary bead fragments. Jet is a mineral, a sort of very hard coal. The glass pendant fragments included two identifiable types, a Punta Rasa pendant and a San Luis pendant, along with 
two other sort of generic glass pendants. The faceted jet beads were often incorporated into rosaries, a series of beads strung to mark a set pattern of prayers. Now, several of the glass beads from the exterior of the kitchen, along with all of the pendant and rosary bead fragments, came from the highest levels of excavation over what we would later define as Feature 124. Feature 124 was a pit that measured 4.7 by 3.2 meters, or about 15 by 10 feet, that had a maximum depth of 123 centimeters below surface, or about four feet deep. Like all of these pit features at San Luis, the most common artifacts were potsherds, and the great majority of them were fragments of traditional Appalachian vessels. Unlike most of these features, Feature 124 held a few more fragments of imported Spanish tableware than fragments of imported storage containers. Kelowna ware sherds were also numerous. All the broken majolica and Kelowna ware in this feature might be another indication that some of the friars' tableware was kept in the kitchen. Feature 124 also held many glass beads and other items of jewelry. We counted 870 glass beads or glass bead fragments. Remember, there were several pendants from the excavation levels above where the pit was defined, but the feature proper also contained a couple more, one of glass and one of crystal quartz. There were two fingering fragments, one made of glass and one of silver. A cast brass Higa pendant was also recognized. Higas were pendants formed in the shape of a closed fist that were supposed to protect the wearer from the evil eye. We've recovered many of them at San Luis, but the vast majority are carved from the mineral jet. In Spanish society, Higa pendants were commonly, although not exclusively, associated with women and children. We've assumed that it was Appalachian women who were cooking for the friar and his assistants. It might be that the beads from the kitchen's interior, especially along with the high numbers of beads and jewelry items from feature 124, are evidence of just that. The contexts of the walkway connecting the kitchen to the friary also held about 20 glass beads and another example of a cast brass higa. Thus far at San Luis, we've only found three of the metal higa pendants and two of them were associated with the kitchen. Of course, there was a lot of evidence for diet recovered from these excavations. We took many soil and flotation samples from various contexts, and some of them have been analyzed by specialists. Animal bone is seldom preserved in the acidic soils of San Luis, and the kitchen, including feature 124, was no exception. There were tiny fragments of burned bone scattered throughout, both inside and outside of the kitchen's walls. Two excavated samples contained denser tooth fragments. Several pig teeth were identified from just outside the northeast corner of the kitchen, and a small shark tooth was identified from one of the walkway features. It's really no surprise that pork and fish were being prepared. We've identified both from some of the larger pits in the Spanish village. I think there is also evidence of chickens and perhaps wild game being prepared in the kitchen, even though we didn't find any bones of these animals. References to chickens are included in some of the mission period records. In 1703, the governor of La Florida was ill and asked for chickens to be sent from Appalachian province to St. Augustine. I suppose chicken soup has been a cure-all for a long time. 50 chickens from San Luis were rounded up and sent with an Appalachian labor crew traveling to St. Augustine. Chickens are among the birds that need to ingest hard objects to grind tough foods in their gizzards. They tend to pick up just about anything they can swallow small stones, glass fragments, and even broken pottery. During the grinding process, those items become worn and polished. These objects, known as gastroliths,
can enter the archaeological record when the bird dies, maybe when it was butchered, or when the gastroliths are ground small enough, they are passed. We have recognized worn and polished items like these from throughout San Luis in both Spanish and Appalachian contexts. The gastroliths are things that would only be available around human activity. Chert flakes from stone working, glass fragments from broken bottles, glass and quartz bead fragments. Thus far, the single structural context at San Luis that held the greatest number of gastroliths is the mission kitchen. The building's interior contained 115 of the polished chert and glass flakes. Feature 124 contained at least 258 gastroliths, including one that is clearly the broken tip of a small mission period arrow point, and all the other contexts yielded about 40 more of them. The gastroliths indicate the importance of chickens and their eggs in the mission diet, a much greater importance than that suggested by the very small number of identified chicken bones from San Luis. Another artifact might be evidence of game being prepared in the kitchen. We found 11 examples of larger round lead shot from the kitchen excavations, and three were from inside the building. These musket balls may be evidence of larger game being prepared at the kitchen. More interesting, to me anyway, was the numbers of very small lead shot. Lead pellet shot, like that used in today's shotgun shells, was recovered in high numbers from the kitchen's interior, but not all of these can be assigned to the mission period. We found a couple of modern shotgun shell fragments in the upper levels of excavation here, so some of the lead pellets are probably related to later shooting activities. The lead shot in feature 124, however, can confidently be assigned to the late mission period. The feature held one larger example of musket shot, along with 71 examples of the small pellet shot. That number of small lead pellets is the highest number of scatter shot that has been found at San Luis from any single context. Feature 124 could hardly be called a small feature but its size and depth pales in comparison with some of the larger pit features in the Spanish village. We fine screened the larger pits too, but not one held a comparable number of small shot. I think this finding indicates that small game taken with scatter shot was occasionally being processed at the kitchen. Pellet shot often remains in the skins and discarded portions of small game and it may be that some of those discarded portions were tossed into this pit while it was being filled. While most of the kitchen's faunal remains didn't survive, its carbonized plant remains were better preserved. One thing that was clear from the first units we opened was that there was a lot of carbonized hickory nutshell in and around the kitchen. Ultimately, we recorded over 650 grams of charred hickory nutshell. Now that's about a pound and a half, and although it may not seem like that much, it's far greater than anywhere else at San Luis thus far. Hickory nuts were collected, crushed, and boiled, shells and all, to produce a sort of oil used for cooking and as an additive to stews and porridges. It seems clear that this hickory nut oil was being produced at the kitchen. Other plant remains from the kitchen expand on those found within the friary. The three main contexts with good plant remains were the rubble over the floor, area 611, the clay floor itself, feature 110, and area 648, feature 111, representing the clay stove deposits. Between those three contexts, some of the New World crops that the Appalachians grew, corn, common beans, and squash, were identified. Appalachian province was one of the few parts of Florida where wheat could be grown with some success, and the Old World crops of wheat and cow peas, or black-eyed peas, were recognized, along with peach and introduced fruit. 
A few other locally available nuts and fruits were also identified. Now, the best evidence of the Spanish diet was seen in the large trash pits in the Spanish village. Faunal remains were better preserved in those pits and proved the abundance of beef and pork in their diet. Those pits also held nearly the same range of plant foods as was found in the kitchen, along with some additional foods like figs and garbanzo beans. Taken as a whole, it appears that the diet of the Franciscan friars wasn't all that different from the other Spaniards at San Luis. Liquid-based stews and soups were probably typical fare. Cattle remains were recovered at the friary, so domesticated animals, cattle, pigs, and chickens, along with fish and probably some wild game, supplied their meat diet. The Appalachians' staple crops of corn, beans, and squash were joined by more familiar European foods like black-eyed peas and bread made from wheat flour. Well, I hope you've learned a, a little something and enjoyed hearing about the Mission Kitchen at San Luis.